The great ones, they're different. They really are. Not better, just different. Sure, there's a physical power, a mental strength, a complex but resolute constitution too. There's a whole lot more than just the measurables. That's something else, that intangible. It separates us from them. Welcome to the Legends series on Andy Raymond Unfiltered. This interview is dedicated to Mike Raymond, one year on. Broadcaster, pioneer, but most importantly, my dad and my best mate. On day one of my working life in 1990, it was dad, as my boss, that sent me on my first ever job to pick up a guy from the airport. That guy was Mal Meninga. Sure, there's a few more greys now, but that's about the only thing that's changed with Mal. He's the same. Despite the accolades, despite the pressures, despite living in life's spotlight, he's just Mal. What follows over the course of the next three episodes is perhaps the greatest insight and most complete story on the man yet. He doesn't seek well dones. He doesn't do sorries. He just tells it as it is, unfiltered. But who is Mal Meninga? Goodness gracious, Andy. Um, whew, Australian South Sea Islander, you know, so very proud of my heritage. Um, got a real good sense of history. Um, love the good old days, obviously. You know, my growing up was was fantastic. So I've got my values, you know, from my, my mum and dad uh, and family. So I think the real Mel Meninga would be... Um, I feel I'm, I'm an introvert. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, I'm, you know, I, I think I'm humble. I'm sincere. I believe that I'm, I'm loyal. Um, I believe that. Don't take the don't take the piss out of me because I can I am very competitive as well. Yes. And I love winning. You know. So regardless of of those those humble beginnings, um, I'm a person that I feel that. When riled, um, we'll, we'll come back at you and most times win. The eldest of four sons to Norman and Leona, as you said, of Australian South Sea Islander heritage, you traced the family lineage back to the island of Tanner in the Vanuatu Island group and learned, and this is only a couple of years ago, that it was your great-grandfather Edward that sought passage to Australia over 130 years ago. You didn't know a whole lot about your family's history. How personally rewarding and beneficial was that? Having a look at the family tree, it, it was it was the best thing I've done in life. To be honest with you, wow. um, I mean, besides get married and have kids and you know um, all the sentimentality that comes around all that, but that was the best thing I've done personally in my life. Not only for me, but for my family. Um, there was always. You know, stories around, you know, blackbirding and, you know, the Kanakas, um, you know, taken off the island to work in the, the sugar industry of, of Queensland and northern New South Wales. Um, we never never quite understood um, why our great grandfather, you know, chose to stay or how he yep. how he how he stood how he stayed in, in Queensland because of the white Australia policy, you know, was rife at that time. Uh, so yeah, so that that journey for me and, and for my family and not just in my greater family. It just wasn't, you know, the three bros and, um, and, but it, all my cousins, you know, we've got yeah. plenty of those, those people hanging around on this earth as well. So, uh, for me it was, yeah, it was a, the greatest journey because we, we finally understood, you know, how did Mary Ellen Kelly come into our lives? You know, a white Irish woman. Um, why did, you know, great grandfather was it because of the white Australia policy was it because, um, he had to marry a white person to, to stay here, you know. Um, we, and through that journey, we found out all the all the the answers to those questions. So what we did understand is that he jumped off the rocks at you know South Tanner Island, um, swam out to the Roderick Drew do for better life. And that was his motivations. He jumped off there. He wasn't black birded. Um, he wasn't coerced. Um, he, it was his decision to jump off the rocks. And um, and we also found he, you know, he obviously made his way to Meribara and then he was 
you know, cutting, cutting a cane cutter around that region yeah. for a, a number of years. Um, found his way up to Mariba as well, and eventually we found found out that, and the way we we tracked this, Andy was quite remarkable, because the number on the Roderick do right was the number four. So that's how we traced his number uh, wow. from Taylor Island, South Taylor Island, to Queensland and all the the areas that he worked in by the number four. Wow. So, you know, I mean, ironically, I mean, that, that, that touched my heart because, you know, when you look at origin footy, like I'm number four, yeah. I'm the Queensland yeah. of, of all time, you know. So, um, so that was fantastic. And then we also got to understand that he actually married Mary Ellen Kelly um, yeah, at Bauble, you know, mm. so she was working at Bauble. She was a house servant there um, of Irish the lineage. Um, a lot of her family uh, left left Ball Ball and went over to Massachusetts. You know, so there's a whole heap of uh, Kelly family over in Massachusetts that you know is related to us in some form. But they married for love, Andy. You know, so here's this this black man, this white woman in 1907, or the early 1900s. You know, with uh, the white Australia policy. Um, you know, racism, racism rife, yes. slavery rife slavery rife and um and all of a sudden they married for love so it would have been it would have been it took extraordinary courage yeah um and love to to do what they did and we also found out they had six children you know so um and it's made a lot of sense now actually everything connected you know because over the years you hear oh, i'm related to mal or uh, to the family and you're never never quite sure but being on that journey and and you know finding out all these different things by the number four <laughs> Um, and marrying a white woman, yeah. that, was, that was in the annals, that was in the logs, marrying a white woman, Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Kelly. Um, that's how we traced her back. Um, unfortunately, we passed away at 44. She passed, when she came to Brisbane and uh, she's buried at uh, Tuong, the big Tuong Cemetery. Okay. You know, we didn't know all this sort of stuff. You know, great grandfather was buried at Miraburra, you know, nondescript grave. You know, there's no headstone and stuff. We made sure that that has been, you know, rectified. So, yeah, it was an extraordinary story and and it sort of completed me in a way you know because i do believe i do believe that you know everything you do is is conditioned around history and you've got to pay your respects to those that come before you you've got to make sure that you know you understand their battles to make it a better place you know for you to live in and he come here just to make a better life for himself and he and, he, and um and because he had that attitude it enabled you know people like myself to to to, you know, to explore the riches of Australia and and um, to do what we did, you know, and, and still doing in life. It shows we're never too old to keep learning. Was that an emotional journey? Obviously very rewarding, but an emotional journey? It got really emotional when we found his grave, yeah. Andy, a nondescript grave, you know, just a bit of grass in a, in the cemetery in Mirabara. Um So it got really, because, you know, all his trials and tribulations, all the, all the, his journey and the things that he had to, had to, overcome and challenge and be challenged by, you know, he was in the, it was obviously, a tenor man was uh, in the cane industry, cane cutting industry was a most valued um, employee, okay. you know, so, he, but he he stuck up for his rights as well, we found out, you know, he was, not only was he act on behalf of of the of the Australian South Sea Island or the people from Tanner, he was, he, because in the sugar cane industry in those times, we had, you know, the, the Italians and the Greeks yep. and the Chinese and all all people from all walks of life, you know, working in working in under those conditions of you know, getting the problem with the with the um, the Australian South Sea Islander though. So most most of those people I described were getting say fifty quid a year. Um, the, the Tanner and the South Sea Island people um, were only getting six quid a year, you know. So so he stuck up for his rights. So he was one of the one of the guys that. You know, got better work conditions around money and around food and around and with the living conditions and things like that. So, you know, yeah, it was, and then to see him, this nondescript grave, all the things, all the battles that he, that he had to overcome, um, they find this nondescript grave, you know, in, in the heart of Mirabara, mm. um, got, re- got really emotional. 60 years of age this year, Mal, when you look back at your life, are you most proud of what you've achieved as a player, a coach or a man? <sighs> Um, I think I think I'm proud of who I am, Andy. And I'm, yep. um, I think I've remained loyal to my values. You know, um, yeah, bumps and yeah, 
you know, little bumps along the way, little hurdles along the way that, you know, that, that you know, pushes in different directions. But I think ultimately um, the person I was, you know, when I was six or seven with that personality and, and, I, and you know, I was really shy. Um, I'm proud of the fact that I got over that shyness, you know, at an early age. Um, I think I've remained fairly, you know, fairly simple and the way I look at life and, you know, live life and, and you know, I, I don't seek the headlines, you know, that's that's what, how I feel about it, you know. It might not seem that way at times, but, um, yeah, I just think I've been true to myself and pretty loyal uh, to my values. You're listening to Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legends series. We have corporate and private sponsorship packages available. You set the terms. For further information on how you can become part of the team, go to the website, andyraymondunfiltered.com.au and hit the sponsorship tab. I was asked last week, uh, what's Mal like as a bloke? And the first word that came to mind was grounded. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, because that's humility, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I really worked out. I mean, my, my parents were humble people, you know, very, very patient. Um, you know, we didn't, we weren't wealthy, you know, we were actually poor. You know, mum was holding down three jobs, dad, dad a couple, you know, he was, playing, he was a local captain coach and working in the sawmills or the abattoirs. Um, but I, I didn't see that. I didn't see the poorness, you know. I, I saw how rich our family was and how much fun I had and, you know, how much we all cared about and, and loved, you know. So I, I consider myself very lucky growing up um, and I feel lucky in the sense that they taught taught me a lot about, you know, humility and respect and, you know, because, um, you know, we're, you know, when mum and dad got married um, in 59, um, there was none at the wedding, you know, because so, they're black and white too, you know, we're yeah. going back to the late 50s and, you know, racism was still still prevalent in those days, obviously, you know. So I mean, yeah, that it wasn't a wasn't a marriage that either family really uh, condoned, you know. So so you know, we grew up protected from all that all that, and you know, Dad was such a Mum was such a respected you know people in their communities, yep. and particularly in the rugby league communities, and that's what I seen. I seen that respect, you know, amongst others. Um, in those communities and, and how mum and dad were treated and how they treated us, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I feel very fortunate that, you know, the life I've, I've lived, uh, it all, but it all comes through my upbringing. What are your standing memories about those younger days? I guess days that started at sunrise and finished at sunset with the former Ninga boys playing backyard footy. Yeah, well, that's exactly what we did. You know, we played backyard footy, you know. I'd, um, dad obviously was a local cap, captain coach of whatever team, you know, he was coaching you know, way out in you know, places like Monto and Thangul, uh, Wandai, Meribara, those sort of places. And I used to, we used to go to footy with Dad, you know, and played footy at you know, two times a week. At, yeah. And sometimes used to train when I got a bit older, you know, train in the, in the sides with Dad, you know, play little games of touch and things like that. That's what I remember. Um, going to school, I had a great time going to school. I'd, we actually loved going to school because in those days, school was riddled with sport, you know. <laughs> Um, the sport, again, the sporting community, you know, there's, you learn a lot and I enjoyed engaging going to school. Um, but, you know, used to get to school earlier and play an hour of soccer, you know, as an example, you know, before going into class. And I, I regard with my, my brothers just recently, you know, um, about it all, because I remember I did this right into through to high school, you know, go early, play soccer or play touch or something, then go, go, to, go into class and then, you know, at little break, you might play some other game then you lunchtime you play some more games and then afternoon breaks more then after school you do some more stuff as well and I remember you know going into class and I would have been saturated I was you know I, I sweat at the best times and I sweat in Canberra you know so so um I must have stunk I must have stunk I was sitting you know I was sitting in class and trying to dry off and I must have reeked of you know body odor most days so you know that's probably why I was introverted and people wouldn't didn't want to talk to me you know were you athletic and talented even as a young fella ah uh, yeah yeah no yeah. so yeah I was sort of yeah I was the you know in a way people <laughs> people are jealous of me you know you know kids are jealous of me because I win everything Andy yep. you know I was one of those kids you know um didn't quite understand at the time I mean I got that many blues at school it wasn't funny you know because yeah. of it 
Yeah, but you know, but it's just part of your living and and growing up and and trying to understand it. You know, um, mum and dad used to say to me, "Don't worry about it." You know, it's just you know if, but if you know if they're putting, if they're trying to you know bag you or something, they haven't got a smile on their face. Well, then you know they're pretty serious, mate. So then you have to yeah. worry about protecting yourself. You know, so um, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I think I still, I mean, I still hold, I think under nines, I think it was when I was at Thangool, you know, I went to the Calide Valley Championships and I won every event. And I think I still, still hold some records out there, Andy. Beautiful. Yeah, I think. As the journey continued, how things could have been so different? You could still be a police officer. You served with the Queensland badge on your chest for just under a decade. Good memories? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's funny, it's fading. So I always wanted to be a policeman. So, you know, when I was growing up, when we got black and white TV, when our first black and white TV was in Monto, and um, there's just the ABC really in those days, you know. So um, there was shows on TV like Matlock Police and Division 4 and Homicide and all those shows that they were showing at the particular time when you know, black and white TV kicked off uh, through the early 70s as well. I um, always wanted to be a policeman, so I had this, and I used to read in a Blyton books, um, you know, um, just about the, you know, the Secret Seven, the Famous Five, and all that sort of stuff. You know, I just I love reading about you know detective stuff. Um, so yeah, I was always destined to join the police force, and you know, in those days, you can join the police force after junior certificate. So I did my junior certificate at um, at Richardo High School, and then went down into the academy. But that's where fate took over when you talk about footy, rugby yeah. league for me. Um, it wasn't till then that I actually had any ambitions about rugby league and what I wanted to do, you know. But growing up in the bush, you, you didn't know the Res Gasniers or the Johnny Rapers. You, you didn't even know too much about, you know, Brisbane rugby league, you know, really. You, you followed the local team, yep. um, you know. So so it wasn't until I got a bit of an eyeful of, you know, Brisbane and you know, meeting Wayne Bennett at, at the academy, you know, when I was 15 years of age, um, that I started to think about rugby league as a career. How influential was Wayne on those early decisions, maturing decisions, I guess? Um, well, he was the first person I think I ever believed in, you know, so I mean, yep. beside mum and dad, obviously, you know, so um, he had faith in me around my ability and to have someone like at 16 years of age to have that faith in you and that, to tell you that you can do anything in life if you put your mind to, um, whom I respected, um, and a great mentor of mine, sort of put me on the on the right path. So he introduced me to goal setting, you know, the Vince Lombardi way, you know. So we, I grew up with Wayne with with the Vince Lombardi videos, you know, around around all that. And and I, from meeting Wayne, I started setting goals in life. Um, and I remember, I remember vividly, and you know, I was 17 years of age, going to play for the Queensland Police Academy. Got us in a in a circle and started talking to us individually about what he thought of us. And that's where he said to me, Mal, you can do anything in life as long as you put your mind to it. And that's when I went up to my room after that and read out, read out some goals. And this is when I was 17. I set up, and one of my first goals I wanted to do um, was play for Queensland uh, when I was 19 years of age. And that was one of the first goals I, I ever Put on a piece of paper for me from a futuristic point of view, and I was put some you know police goals down and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, and you know, from there, obviously, you know, I achieved that in '79. Yeah. You know, I played for Queen then my first year with the Magpies, and and uh, been setting goals ever since. So he was really around that time, around that that teenage time when you needed some direction. You know, um, the police academy was excellent for me because it gives you a really good sense of discipline. Um, they made you do stuff, so it actually, yep. all of a sudden, you got yourselves in really good routines, and that that's that's held me in really good stead, you know, through my life. Griffin Air Conditioning offers the highest quality of air conditioning sales and service across the Sydney metropolitan area, providing installation and maintenance to commercial, domestic, and industrial customers. Working with this team, you'll be guaranteed the latest services technology and developments in the industry. Visit griffinair.com.au and tell them we sent you for a cool deal. In terms of goals, are you a short-term or long-term goal setter? 
Um, I think um, where I'm at in life now is that uh, I'm, it's pretty short term. So, but it's evolving goals, you know. So, it's nearly goals per day. It's around you know priorities, how you want to, you know, what do you want to do, what do you want to achieve, you know. So it's it's nearly an everyday thing for me. Um, and, and and it's not like jotting down a piece of paper. Um, you know, what your priorities are for the day is that's goal setting, you know, what, what sort of things you want to achieve, you know, um, through the day. So I do it on a, on a regular basis every day. You mentioned the magpies. It's difficult in 2020 to accurately explain to those that weren't around then just how competitive, how good and how high the quality of the Brisbane comp was in those early days. Some wonderful footballers and footy. Yeah, it was, Andy. It's, it's a shame. And... Um, the way I describe it was in 81, so I'm only here, I am, I'm only a uh, 20-year-old going on 21, mm. and uh, Bob McCarthy come to the South, so, um, he, he come there in 80, but in 81, uh, Bob McCarthy, who's the, you know, the great South Sydney you know, back rower, um, you know, highly decorated, uh, great coach, you know, um, taught, me a lot, <laughs> taught, taught me a lot about you know, footy and, and things like that, mm. you know, the, some of the stories he tells, he's a great, he's a great storyteller. Yeah. But he took us. He took us down. So, in '80, South Sydney, I think, made the finals. Uh, they might have, might have even been the minor premiers the year before. So he took South Brisbane um, in '81. This is the Bruce Astles and you know, um, people like that uh, who were at South at the time, um, trying to cast me by my back. You know, Bob Calloway's, um, Billy Johnson, you know, all those sort of guys. That was that, who played or played state footy. You know, so like, and Billy, you know, he played for for the Bulldogs you know, in later years as well. We had a trial match against South Sydney and they beat us, Andy, I think it was 11-2 in that game. So here, here, here we were. So if you looked at South, who were probably you know, the top of the top of the tree, you know, along with um, yeah. Valleys and, and Wynnum at those t- that, that time, uh, that era. Um, so, you know, you're looking at, you know, nearly top five or just outside top five, the top teams in Brisbane. May 22nd, 1979, your first time in Queensland Colours. Pre-origin, as you said, it was interstate footy. That was the term anyway. You scored a try, kicked a goal. In fact, Queensland's only points on debut. What do you recall of that night? Not much, Andy. <laughs> Not much at all. It's a long time ago. Um, so, you know, obviously, historically, um, you know, I talked to, when I took over the Queensland team as a coach, we talk about those sort of those sort of times. And the thing that I got out of that is that, you know, we were very happy to get selected, selected in the Queensland side, you know, put that maroon jersey on, um, but didn't quite have that self-belief yeah. that we could actually win it. You know, we're sort of, we go into those games with, in the back of our minds thinking, you know, a lot of things have got to go our way uh, to actually, you know, compete. So that's, that's, and then, you know, the messaging that comes through those camps, well, you, you're about to compete for a certain amount of time in the game, you know, so it might be into the same middle half of the middle half of the second half yeah. as an example, but then you'll get sort of run over and that's what normally happens, you know. So that's that's the sort of mentality we I reckon we had yep. um in those times. So um yeah, so that's what I remember. I remember not having quite had that self belief that you could match it with the big guns, you know, which was New South Wales at that particular time and uh they were my memories out of it all. Did self belief come in 1980 when the state of origin concept was born it was a perfect timing for origin and that you know the catalyst for self-belief for queensland teams it was a perfect timing and um and all the decision makers the ron mccallis and the and the humphreys all those sort of guys you know congratulations because without without their foresight and their courage to do that uh, because there's a lot of there's a lot of band. I mean, above the border, they said, yes, let's do it. Below the border, they were saying, you know, it's a, just a, you know, it's a Mickey Mouse game. We're not, you know, we're not going to compete, but you look where it is today. But yeah, I mean, it was. And winning that game for us young fellows and playing alongside the Arthur Beats and, you know, Rocket Reddies, who we played against, you know, not Arthur, but Rocket and Johnny Lang and, um, you know, Rod Morris, um, Greg Oliphant, those sort of Kerry Bosted, you know, we played against those guys and, in the, uh, for new, they were playing for New South Wales, so yeah. yeah, it was for us. Well, how good's this? You know, this is this this just tells you that all our if you get all our Queensland players back, yeah. we're always going to be competitive, and even more so than that, we can win. 
Those early Queensland sides, and I know many of this generation speak glowingly about the Queensland side of, I guess, 06 through to 17, and rightfully so, I'm still not convinced as good a side as this more recent one was that they would have beaten those early 1980s sides. What do you think? Goodness, Andy, I, I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I think um, it's a very good question. I, I don't think I've got the answer for you, to be honest with you, because it's a different era, different time, um, you know, different training methods, different ways of preparing, yes. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Professional, they're better professional these days. Um, you know, we weren't. We weren't professional in, in our days. Um, but uh, what I what I do say about eras is that if given the same situation, circumstances. So, say so if a Wally lost, I give you know Wally. Everyone knows Wally. If he was playing today under under the same conditions that every other player is playing, under, you know the their strength and conditioning, their fitness, their speed training, their, you know, all that, their recovery, you know, all that sort of stuff that happens today, he'd be a better player today than he was back then, yeah. in my opinion. You know what I mean? So I just think that, and if Cameron Smith, you know, went back and played in, in the 80s and, and late 70s, um, he'd be a great player back there yeah. as well. You know what I mean? So I just think that it's it's hard to compare us, but I just feel that your best players, you you your best players in each era would always play from any era. And I, and I go back to Clive Churchill, you know, he'll, he'd, he'd be able to play in this era up here, given the same you know professionalism that the current players have. Wally gets a lot of the praise, as do you, and rightly so, you're both phenomenal. Who were the teammates that didn't get the praise they probably deserved from those early years? So you, you'd have to say externally you're talking about, yeah. you know. So I mean, because in, internally, you know, we always, you know, we always valued each other's contribution. Yeah. Um, I think someone like Bobby Linder. You know I mean, but I know that you know Bobby's yeah. got a great, you know, he's got a, had a great great career, but um, probably doesn't get quite get the accolades that he that he deserved. You know, Rowdy Rowdy Shearer. Yeah. I would, you know, I think that he was phenomenal. Every time he put a maroon jersey on. Yeah, he was sensational, you know. Um, Nate Miles, yeah. if you go to the modern era, you know, it's just I think players like that, the Dallas Johnsons, those players that, you know, they're unassuming. Um, you know, they they play really good, consistent rugby league at the club level, um, but they lift a, they lift a, another gear, you know, and they put that maroon jersey on, um, and they just value with people with people, the players that you know, players love playing with. Um, you know, the Wally Fulton Smiths, that that type of player. You know, the f- Fatty Fatty was a great player, but he, he was he was certainly well known and um, you know winning premierships and things like that. But the unsung ones like the the Brian Nieblings yeah. of the time, you know, just people like that who who keep on performing at that level every game. So I mean, you pick a you pick a Queensland time, um, but certainly through. My time and, and through the latest time, you know, you just keep on. If you're loyal to your players, the players will be loyal to the jersey. In part two of the Mal Meninga story, we talk about the 82 and 86 Kangaroo Tours, his first premiership, and also about the realisation he was getting big-headed. We hope you're enjoying Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legends series. Before you go, we'd love a five-star rating and review on the app you're listening to, just to help us spread the word about the podcast. Come back soon, legends. Welcome back, legends. In part one of the Mal Meninga story, we heard about the emotional search for identity, the formative years in the Meninga house, and his early footballing. The story continues. From the New South Wales side of the border, it was always referred to as Wally and Mal. Were you two mates or just teammates? Um, we're, we're teammates initially, but we turned into mates. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, cause, you know, there's a real strong rivalry. And you asked me, the first question you asked me is who I am, yep. you know, who is the real Mel Meninga, but I'm, I am competitive. 
um, in Wally, Wally was playing for Valleys and I was playing for South. And they did beat us 26 nil in that grand final. And then they did ring us up and um, through the middle of the night and bag us and things like that and chuckle and give us, you know. So I don't forget those things. I don't forget those things, you know. Um, but we eventually become become mates. And um, yeah, I mean, we play for different teams. And in those days, it's it's funny. You know? I mean, you look at the, the modern teams, they'll go shake their hands and they might have a beer with them after, you know. We, we didn't do that nowadays, you know. Yep. We're enemies. We were enemies. We, we played a different footy team. We wanted to beat you, you know. So, and so we didn't really mix. But we, we eventually, you know, went in the BRL because um, it wasn't professional and it wasn't wasn't even semi professional really. Um, you know, we'd see each other out often at night time. You know, through the weekends and the off seasons and things like that. And um, you know, Wally tells the stories of you know him going down to. Uh, down to the Gold Coast and you know, being part of the surf clubs and a lot of players, a lot of rugby league players had that affinity with the surf clubs and started mixing there. But once you get on the footy field, mate, you're enemies, honestly. And um, it took us a while to, to warm up. But, you know, once we, we eventually become mates, you know, when we went touring and in 82 on the kangaroo tour and things like that, you know, it's hard not to be a mate. Did it feel at the time, because you were still early 20s, that the journey and your journey was a million miles an hour and you could do no wrong? A few months with Souths, into the Queensland side, three years later you're playing and touring with the Kangaroos. That is on a rocket ship to stardom in a very short period of time. Yeah, thanks Andy. Um, I believed in myself and my ability um, and I think, you know, like I said before, the catalyst was 1980 with the origin it, for my self-belief, for me, you know. So here's an introvert, introverted young fella, um, policeman, dark of skin, you know, so I got plenty at that time, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, that self-belief and having really good people around me was really important. You know, yep. Wayne was around, then Bob McCarthy. Um, you know, Tony Tony Tester, who was the chairman of South at the time, was an extraordinary person, you know. Okay. So optimistic and so positive. I remember, like in 81, the beginning of 81, the pre-season, we had to do deportment classes you know see so he's he's here he is prepping us for the future you know so we did so you know we're doing you know things like um you know how to set a table properly and hygiene and issues and we did a toastmasters course andy so wow. he made us do the whole team do a toastmasters course um which we had to stand up in front of people and talk and here i am i'm thinking this is my worst nightmare yeah. you know about to do things. but he made us do this do that and and because of the things that the extraordinary vision that he had um, through all this, it, it, it turned us into better people and, and more confident people. Um, so I owe a whole heap of, whole heap of, um, you know, accolades towards you know Tony Teston and his forward thinking at South at the time. And I had a really good mateship, you know, with from the police force. I had a really, really strong group of mates yep. that I hung around with, and and I, I, and I tell this story. Um, my head started getting big, and at that period, you know, it, it was skyrocketing. I got, I started getting a big head. Um, and I was, you know, I was starting to feel really confident about myself and and doing the wrong thing, honestly, you know, around drinking too much alcohol and partying and all this sort of stuff. And my mate said to me one day, said, "Mel, just pull your head in, you know, you're acting like an idiot." Um, and that struck me, and I said, "He's right, eh? He's right." Wow. Um, and that, that was that was when I was 21 years of age. This is 81 as well when I started to get that big head. Now, I come back, begin of 81. You know, I was running with the front row forwards and hardly could keep up there. I put on that much weight on that to big off season and things like that. Just, you know, just being silly, you know. So so I learned some really valuable lessons. And, you know, Tony Tester, like I said, and with Wayne and, and Bob McCarthy, you know, kept us on the on the right path, which was great. And being in the police force, that certainly helps as well. But I think everyone goes through, you know, the, the ups and downs. They, yeah. I think everyone gets a big head, you know, yep. particularly that age. And um, I was just lucky I had the right people around me to pull me back in line and, and put me back on course real quick. Four kangaroo tours and the record. The 82 tour was labelled the Invincibles. The 86 tour was labelled the Unbeatables. Wonderful football sides. What are your standout memories from two tours that will never be replicated or duplicated uh, and will remain in the history books as an absolute highlight for as long as the game has played. Yeah, eighty two was um, 
again, I was very fortunate. I roomed with Steve Rogers. Wow. And, you know, he's the doyen of, of you know Australian centres or world class centres. He was fantastic. Um, and then in the locking room uh, was Rocket Ready and Max Quillich, who was the captain of the, the team. So, so those three guys, those three guys taught me a lot about touring. You know, so <laughs> the good, the good the old bad. fashioned, good old fashioned touring, and, yeah. and how to get the balance right. You know, because yeah. uh, you know, here I am, twenty two years of age, you know, mixing with the old fellows. Really, you know, Craig Young was there, Les Boyd. I, I, I was, I was taken under their wing of you know, the old fellows, wow. um, and I was playing obviously the test matches, and you know, we're we're winning, you know, games very comfortably yeah. and stuff, but. They taught me how to tour. They taught me the, the time when time when to, to have a good time and time when to be serious, basically. And um, so I was really lucky in '82. Um, then '86, it was different for me, you know, because you know, Don Foyner was the coach and he was the Canberra coach as well, um, was the team I was playing for. But I couldn't make the side, Andy. That's how good it was, you know. So I mean, they had Gene Miles and Brett Kenny because yeah. uh, Sterlow and Wally were the were the halves, um, and you know. I think it was um, Michael o, Michael O'Connor and I think Dale Shearer were the were the yes. were the wingers, you know. So and and John Rebo. So I mean, yeah, I couldn't make. I was on the bench. I was the myself and Terry Lamb. Terry Lamb played every game on tour. I, know, I think someone nineteen or nineteen odd games on tour. I played about thirteen games, but I couldn't make the go. Couldn't make the run on side. So that was a strong side too. The unbeatables. Um, again, they took everything before them and. Um, I played a, I played a, you know, a, a supporting role on that on that tour. But I still had a great time, and um, my roomie was Brett Kenny at the time. So you know, um, so I showed him the ropes. I showed him how to party and have a good time and get a balance. And, and uh, but he took my spot in the team. So we used to have many fights. We used to have many fights in the bedroom yeah, all the time. <laughs> but uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, kangaroo tour is a lot of fun and. And out of those kangaroo tours, you do make, you know, mates for life, honestly. Yeah. You know, you wait 10, 10 weeks of, of uh, uh, together in a, in a hotel room with Dragon R and Leeds in single beds, mm. you know, in twin rooms, single beds. Um, you do get on really well. If you don't get on, well, you might struggle over there. But, you know, the, obviously the the um, the confidence and the, the camaraderie that comes out of those tours is excellent and you know, you see him often. You don't see him that often, but you know, you get reunions and kangaroo unions in particular, and um, just re- reignite you know old memories and and mateship and have a few beers and enjoy yourself. You coach the national side now, and you try to keep the boys sensible off the field. Would have you had much luck trying to keep those touring parties sensible off the field? That's a coach's nightmare. <laughs> so you're going back to the '82, '86 yeah. times, eh? Well, there's no mobile phones, Andy. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, you know, there's today is is your different you know, living conditions, and you know, and if you go on the Australian side at the moment, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't, um, you, you can't do the things we did when we were no. when we were younger, you know. So, and mainly because of the mobile phones, to be honest with you, and social media, and you know, the way the papers come at you these days, to be honest with you. You know, they're always looking for content and yep. if it's not sensational, well then, you know, you'll, you know, you won't get in the papers. Any elite athlete will tell you it takes more than just being physically fit to be at your best. And our friends at Galaxy Finance can have you at the top of your financial game. From home loans to investments and self-managed super funds, they provide complete solutions. Call Galaxy Finance on 1300 91 7740 and mention you heard it on Andy Raymond Unfiltered to get an obligation-free chat to see how Galaxy Finance can assist you. The 1990 tour was your third and first as captain. From our side of the fence, we make a lot of who is named as a captain of a representative side. What did and what does captaincy mean to you? Well, uh, it's it's a leadership role um, and a mentoring role, in my opinion. I mean, I, I went to um, a kangaroo reunion in 2014, Andy, and of the 94 side. So, yep. you know. Uh, it was a 20 years, 20 year reunion, you know, so, or 30 year reunion, okay, 20 year reunion. So, 
I looked around the room and, you know, there's Bob Fulton. I'm mixing with Bob Fulton and Jeff Carr and those sort of guys. And I look around the room and it just, it's just dawned on me, like in 1994, right, how old I was or how much <laughs> more older I was than the players around me. You know, um, you know there's Blocker and, you know, Ciro and all those sort of guys in, in 90. But here I am, you know, in 94, I'm 10 years old and Laurie and, and Ricky and Brad Fittler and, you know, Steve Menzies, Wendell, all those sort of guys, ET, you know, so I'm, I'm the old fellow that, so from a leadership point of view on those, on those sort of tours, I did take on that sort of mentor role uh, around them and showed them and sort of, you know, showed them how to tour really, I, I guess. Um, and, you know, things I learned, you know, with Steve Rogers back in 82 when I was teaching the 90, the 94 guys, you know, around, around it all. And, but then it comes back to, you know, doing the right thing yourself and you know I've always been I think a person that's led by example um, uh, and doing the, all the right things uh, to make sure that you know if I was going to say anything to anyone uh, player wise that I was doing that thing as well so you know I wasn't setting any any I was setting the right standards you know for the for the team and uh, if my expectation is if you know if that's the standard well then you've got to live by those standards and um, and that's the way I think I, I led footy teams is that I led by example, yep. I showed them the way, um, and but I had faith in them though too. I believed in them, I had trust in them, um, yeah, and we had a lot of fun as well. The fun was based off success. But it almost wasn't successful. Game two was locked at 10 all with 10 minutes remaining, then this. Almost no time left in the match. Stewart, here it comes now to Linda. We're well into injury time. 40 seconds, in fact, as it comes away to Stewart again. Stewart throws the dummy. Now Ricky Stewart's on his own. He's up to the halfway. He's waiting for Eddie Housen. He's got support. Eddie Housen with him. They can go to the Nigga. And the Nigga He just scores. Oh, what a try. What a try. What a right from Stewart. And what a try. The Nigga. <laughs> Is that the best you've been a part of? Has there been a better feeling oh, on the well, field? I've got, I've got some bumps on me, you know, yeah. so goosebumps on me. So, um, yeah, it was in, in hindsight, Andy. At the time, it was relief, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we played. So I say well, we played against some really competitive English sides, to be honest with yeah. you. You know, so, I mean, the Larry Hanleys and the Schofields and those sort of guys, you know, I think... Um, they were really, really competitive. You know, we were, I think, complacent in game one at, at Wembley. Um, and we just had to, we had to win. You know, we're under pressure. Yeah. You know, we're going to be the first side in 28 odd years that wasn't going to bring home the ashes, you know, to Australia. So there was a heap of pressure on us. And um, I think we handled that pressure really, really well. Um, I think, you know, one of the tries, I think the first try we scored in that game was probably the best try that yeah. I think a roof size ever scored. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. You know, so we're on, we're on our day. But you know, England kept on, Great Britain kept on hanging in there all the time, and and we were very for, we were we were fortunate because it was ten all with that. They said forty seconds to go yeah. in the call. Uh, we we're lucky that um, the goal kick was missed. To be honest yes. with you, from Great Britain as well. So it was just one of relief. Um, and then we went into into game three at Ellen Road. Yep. Uh, up, you know, one all, and we won that game. 14 mil, Andy. So in my my mind, as captain of that the 1990 side, uh, that was our best victory uh, because off the back of back of obviously, you know, just sneaking home in game two, we were the first team uh, in game three, first team to hold Great Britain to zero in any Test match in its history. So you know, 14 mil against a really competitive Great Britain side, I think, was one of our greater achievements on that tour. Have you ever apologised to poor fucking ET, who was <laughs> running next to Ricky Stewart for the best part of sixty metres, yeah. and, and thought his time had come, and all of a sudden you appeared? I think I think I might have surprised a lot of people actually being that quick, yes. Andy. You know what I mean? So no, I never apologised to him. You know, he came and hugged me straight after him. So he uh, was he was in front of us actually. So I mean, it's funny, eh? Because that particular try, you know, I've bumped. Um, the centre, I can't remember the centre's name now, but bumped him with my shoulder, which you're allowed to do if you're going for the football, yeah. you know, you're allowed to actually shoulder charge each other. So um, that created a lot of controversy and it still does, I guess, to this day. Um, yeah, but, you know, it was a great, 
it was great re- redemption for Ricky, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he threw the intercept pass that, you know, got us to 10 all, I guess, and he was down the dumps. And But, you know, he showed great courage and resilience to get back up. You know, we talked to him about it. You know, you know Gary Belcher had a great, great yarn to him behind the in, in, in goal area. And it was him that actually set up the victory, you know. So, and, you yeah, know, Ricky wasn't renowned for his running game. He was renowned, obviously, for his kick game and his organisational game and his, and his passing game. Um, but, you know, he, he took it upon himself um, uh, to, you know, to win the footy game. And, you know, great, great kudos to him. You know, we just supported that. Um, so, yeah, to, to come back for where Ricky was, the space in a matter of, honestly, minutes, yeah. you know, so it takes great, you know, mental aptitude to do that. And, you know, um, but like I said before, it was was one of relief more than anything else. Like everyone was relieved that we just won all and we can go into game three, you know, uh, without that pressure, and like I said before, fourteen nil was, was a really good result against a really good Great Britain side. You obviously and genuinely seem to enjoy the UK after the eighty-two tour that we spoke about, and for the eighty-four, eighty-five season at a time when the Northern and Southern Games weren't run concurrently, you decided to head over. Uh, both St yeah, Helens uh, and Wigan wanted to sign you, and you ended up with the Saints. I did. Yeah, I um. I do. I do love England. I, I love the crowds. I love the atmosphere. I love the singing. I love their. I just love the, you know, their everyday life. I love their suppers. Yeah. I love going to the pub in the afternoon and having a couple of ales. And, yeah. You know, I just love that type of lifestyle. You know, up in Northern England. Yeah. You know, up in Lancashire or Yorkshire. It's you know to me it, it, that sort of suits me. I, I like that type of lifestyle. Um, yeah. And I was lucky enough to you know, sign on with with the Saints. Um, it was on the back of obviously what happened in the kangaroo tour, but I was going through a bit of a, a down period with my footy and yep. I wasn't playing the best footy and I was, lacked a lot of confidence at the time um, in 84. So I got, you know, I got dropped actually from the Aussie team um, for a test match. We, and uh, so that, that hit me hard. Um, you know, we managed with South, we managed to make the grand final, but we got thumped yep. you know, by Wynnum, you know, can, you know by a fair bit, I think it was 42-8 in the grand final. So my, my confidence was really down. I wasn't contributing the way I wanted to contribute. You know, I wasn't playing the way I wanted to play. Um, so there was this, this was a real opportunity for me to, you know, pick up my confidence and go over there and, and start and just enjoy my footy. Yeah. You know, the, you know, as we know, England's they love they love people scoring tries and yep. you know, entertain them. You know, defence wasn't real a real issue over there. You know, so yeah, it was. Marvelous time for me, you know. I spent, and I got uh, permission, um, leave without pay from the police force to go to do that, um, and I did that. So um, I had a great time over there, well looked after. You know, we, we stayed with a family on a farm, on a dairy farm, out, just outside of St Helens and Eccleston, and uh, you know, we'd sleep in the mornings and go downstairs and breakfast is waiting for you on the table and you know, just things like that. You know, memories, it's just fantastic. And, you know, it was, um, the people of St. Helens were terrific. Yeah, and it's, you know, one of my, one of my probably only, one of my only regrets in, in life, footy-wise, is that I didn't get the opportunity to go back and play again, Andy, because of, okay. you know, ensuing broken arms and things like that. I did sign contracts, but I didn't get the opportunity to go back because of injury and stuff. So, yeah, an enduring memory, uh, which I still hold dear to dear today. You're listening to Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legend Series. We have corporate and private sponsorship packages available. You set the terms. For further information on how you can become part of the team, go to the website andyraymondunfiltered.com.au and hit the sponsorship tab. What stands out from your time over there? Was it the camaraderie? Was it the change of lifestyle? Was it the premiership final against Rovers? Uh, or does it all become a blur and you, it's just one giant happy memory? Yeah, one giant happy memory. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you, you gotta be you got to be happy in life, yeah. you know, before you can before you can perform at your optimum on, the, on, a, on a playing field, on a footy field, my incident. You know, so happy... Happy life, as they say, and a happy wife. Um, you know, not necessarily does, in that order, anyway. <laughs> <not necessarily. laughs> it's probably exactly right. You know, so 
yeah, I just, I just, I really enjoyed myself. Yeah. And and because you enjoy yourself, because you're treated so well, it's just payback all the time. You know, you you don't want to let people down. You know, it's it's just part of your your nature and your DNA. It's just an innate thing you have in in you is that, you know. If people look after you, you're going to look after them. As good as that was, the next chapter in your professional life probably tops it. You moved to Canberra at the beginning of a nine-year journey that may have started slowly, but it finished spectacularly. We'll begin in, let's start with 1989, one of the most unforgettable, or depending on who you were cheering, forgettable grand finals of all time, and a grand final that still ranks up there as one of the all-time yeah. greats. Yeah, just um, a prelude to that, though, Andy. You know, um, it was a change in my life. You know, by going to Saints, I understood I understood what I wanted to do in footy now and I understood that I wanted to make rugby league a bit of a career path and, and prove to the Southerners that, you know, a Queenslander coming down there can actually play footy, you know. So that was – it was a, it was a, a changing – moment in my life because I'd made a decision to, to leave the police force yep. and to take up a career in footy in, in New South Wales and to prove myself. Um, so yeah, it was it was a defining moment and based on the, the, the St. Helens experience of one team town, that's one of the reasons why I went to Canberra. Okay. Now, I didn't want to didn't want to go to Sydney, obviously, but um, and had a few offers, but I didn't I chose to go to Canberra because obviously the national coach was there when in yep. Don Ferner, obviously. But um, I just felt that going there would would have more value for me um, after the, the St Helens experience. It's a big life change for a young man, isn't it? Exactly. You know, so I, I chose I chose to go to Bush instead of City. Yeah. Because uh, that's who I am. You know, that's that's part of that's how I grew up. Um, so that's the reason why I ended up in Canberra um, for a life change because I, I and you couldn't go down to the ACT. Uh, and join the police for you keep your police policing going because you know you're from state to state in those days the jurisdiction didn't allow that so they do these days unfortunately but um, yeah you couldn't do that so I started a new career in life which was playing footy and and becoming a, a salesman you know <laughs> for 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 a company at the time you know so and then then it led to obviously you know um, Wayne coming down in, in 87 as well. Yep. Uh, then obviously the, the Broncos come in in 88 and Tim Sheens uh, come in, in, 80, in 88 to Canberra. So, um, and then we, when we had, you know, Gary Belcher obviously and Gary Coyne and Steve Walters, uh, Chica Ferguson, all those all those gun players we, we gathered in 86, 87. And then all of a sudden we had this talent pool of players, the Ricky Stewart's, Bradley Clyde's, Laurie Daly's. Um, Glenn Lazarus, yeah. you know all these talent, talented players who are now Hall of Famers. Yeah. Um, uh, in that coming through at the same time, so it was a fantastic era for us. So we had the old heads, and we had the new ones, you know. So and Tim Sheens was a, a fledgling, up and coming coach, um, and he proved to be the the right, you know, have the right demeanour for us, you know, to to get us through. He taught us a lot about that footy. Um, he had a really good understanding um, around the technical side of things and, yep. and tactical side of things that you know helped us grow our knowledge in the game. And then obviously it led to '89, and you know '89 in my mind, okay, is the most specialist moment in my footy career because well you invest in so much into, into your footy, you get in there, being a Queenslander, going in there to prove yourself. Um, you're going to Canberra, what are you going to Canberra for? You know, how silly is that? You know, um, it was just a, it was just a, you know, tick of a tick for me to prove that I made the right decisions and proved everybody else wrong, basically. That's my personal thing that I had going. Uh, but the, from the club point of view, um, you know, no team outside of Sydney has ever won the Premiership. You know, no team outside the top three has ever won the Premiership. Um, we had to win nine games to win it. In a row, you know, we we're languishing. And I think um, outside the top five, because you know, in those days uh, we we're going really well through the year. But um, we had a few players on a kangaroo trip to New Zealand for three weeks. The Bradley Clyde, Steve Wallace, I mean, Steve wanted me there, Gary Belcher. But so we had a few players out in the Australian team, 
playing in New Zealand and we had to keep on playing. We didn't didn't win any games through that period of Canberra side. So when we come back, we had to win every game just to make make the finals. And then, then we had to win every game to win the grand final, basically, you know. So it was extraordinary, an extraordinary time. And then obviously the, the game itself, you know, how extraordinary was that? It's, you know, 12, two down at half time, 14 all at, at full time, you know, and then going into that extra time in those days, 100 minutes of footy, you know, and yeah, it was um, it was something special. And, and as they say, and they still say it down here, Andy, um, you know, Canberra grew a soul that particular day. Yeah. And the celebrations around all that and the memories from that, you know, was sensational. We had, it was 300,000 people, just under 300,000 people uh, occup- uh, residents in Canberra. We had 100,000 on ticket tape parade. You know, through the streets of Canberra, and, and, and you know, we got key of the key of the city, and everything was green. You know, um, even the, all the water was green. Everything was green. You know, so it was just a fantastic time for all Canberra. You know, all Canberra it was just great that you know we as players and as a club could bring that to Canberra. So it was something special, mate. I'll use a boxing analogy here. Uh, I've often heard it: that winning the title is hard, defending the title is even harder. Let's fast forward 12 months because you did go back to back in 1990. Was that a harder slog than 89, defending the title? Uh, ironically, no. No, because we're grown as a footy team, you know. So that, again, you know, we talk about origin in 80, about that self-belief and, um, you know, personal development as people. Uh, so 89 group victory, you know, you can imagine like a better Ricky Stewart and a better Laurie Daly and yeah. a better Ken Lazarus and a better Steve Walters and, you know, all these, all these Bradley Clyde, you know, he's my favourite player, you know, so um, they were better players in, in 80, in 1990, Andy, and um, I think we're minor premiers, we won nearly everything in 90, we're, we're super confident um, and, you know, we played with that that confidence, you know, so we had this belief that we we couldn't lose footy games. I'll just rewind there a little bit. Did I hear Bradley Clyde, my favourite footballer? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, he is. You know, from oh, you know the amount of work he did. God blimey, you know, um, he, you know, when you talk about players and errors and stuff, you know, I think he changed the way you know, lock forwards played the game. Hundred percent. You know, um, yeah, on ball all the time. You look at the way. Uh, Jake Tavojevic plays today as an example. You know, he's on ball all the time. He's, yep. You know, he's passing game, you know, ability to, to run when needed, you know. So going back and tackling like a Johnny Raper, you know, yeah. um, in cover defence, those things, you know, he was an incredible, incredible athlete and incredible player. In part three of the Mal Meninga story, we talk about the brutal fallout with Ricky Stewart at the Raiders, the differences between club and origin coaching, and what does being named an immortal really mean? We hope you're enjoying Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legend series. Before you go, we'd love a five-star rating and review on the app you're listening on, just to help us spread the word about the podcast. Come back soon. Legends. Welcome back to Andy Raymond Unfiltered Legends. Previously on the Mal Meninga story, we spoke candidly about his upbringing, kangaroo tours and premierships, but more about the man than just the athlete. The story continues. It had been a tough few years leading into the successes. On a personal note, three broken arms, a lot of time watching and not playing. Was there a time where you thought, okay, I'm done, I'm over this, this is happening too regularly and I can't come back again? No, never. No, I, um, I, I understood that it was just bad luck and lack of patience. You know, so... So the last time I come back, so last time I come back in '89, um, I just gave it time, basically, yep. and work work my butt off. It's the hardest I've ever trained, Andy. Honestly, um, okay. through that period, that 80 month period, it's the hardest I've ever trained. You know, I was doing honestly five days, five hours, you know, five days a week doing swimming or doing weights or running, you know, and just get myself fit as I possibly could. Um, 
it's just a broken arm, mate. You know, yeah. so a broken arm, you know, it mends and actually mends stronger. So I, I just had a bit of bad luck. I had a plate in the arm for a couple, the first couple of times I, I rebroke it. And they broke along the screw lines. Mm. So I just took the plate out and had bone grafts and stuck the, the bone grafts in the holes in my arm and let's let it time to recover and just work my butt off and strengthen that, that, that my arm and the region, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I used it. It was probably, again, another defining moment for me, but I used it because I haven't finished the job, you know? I felt I got plenty to, plenty to offer. Um, and that's when that period did come through, 89 through to 94. Uh, I was off the back of, you know, working my butt off and, and wanted to prove some more points that I could actually, you know, keep on going. 94 was your final year as a player. Fairy tales in this game don't happen all that often. You finished with a premiership and a record-breaking fourth kangaroo tour at the very, very top of your game. Did you retire a year early? I was falling apart um, physically, not mentally, but physically. So uh, it's ironically enough, um, I kept training after the kangaroo tour. So that was in December 94. And I kept training and uh, kept on pushing myself, uh, making sure that, you know, uh, I was doing all the right things. <laughs> um, I didn't want to be, a, uh, which I am now, you know, a retired fat footballer, but um, <laughs> I didn't want to be that, you know. So I just, I remember like six months, six months to the day, I was, I, was, I was running on a treadmill at one of the gyms down here in Canberra and every ache and pain just disappeared. Wow. Just disappeared. And they call it detraining now. So I didn't understand none of that, yeah. the sports science, but they call it detraining. And and this dis- disappeared. And I haven't had really had an ache or pain ever since, since that. So all the aches, I've had a so- you know, sore neck, a you know, crook lower back, a, a crook knee, um, you know, just pains everywhere. Um, and Tim and Sheenza did ask me to come back, but it wasn't until 96, the team was 95, the Raiders only lost two games. Mm. So they didn't need me in 95. <laughs> Uh, didn't make, but 96, they went through a whole heap of injuries and uh, Sheens did ask me to come back, um, but made a decision that was against, I didn't want to do that, you know, so made this hullabaloo of my retiring, you know, buses and stadiums and statues yeah. and all that sort of stuff. It's a bit, you know. Um, so I think 94 was the right time for me. Um, I retired at the top. Um, I've always got, got that, you know, in, under my belt, you know, so... And it's held me in pretty good stead since then, Andy, you know, so I'm still involved in the game at the highest level, which is, you know, fantastic. And um, I'm one of, the, one of the chosen lucky ones, I guess. What was the lure of coaching? You're only out of the game for, for two seasons. What was your initial thought process or, or the trigger moment that you thought, yeah, this is me? Um, well, Dad was always a coach. So I grew up, yep. I grew up, you know, in that sort of environment. Uh, so it's like any rugby league player, I guess, you know, you want to try yourself in, in that arena. Um, so I had the opportunity, Sheenzy was moving on. He was going up to up to the Cowboys in, in 97. So um, the club asked me. Um, so I, I didn't say yes straight away. Uh, I was reluctant. However, um, you know, the senior players were pretty happy with with me coming in and, and um, starting my, my coaching career. And as I said to them, I needed the help. You know, because, you know, it probably was a mistake, Andy, at the time to do it because, you know, you ask any any coach today, you just can't go from playing footy into, into coaching, in my opinion. You've actually got to do the apprenticeship. Yep. You've, got, you've got to go and you've got to understand club land. You've got to understand, you know, your development programs and, you know, your, your roster management, all, all that sort of stuff that you need. And you also got to build a philosophy the way actually you want it, you want to coach. Um, you got to understand how you want to coach. Um, but I learned that on the run, on the run. You know, I went back and did a, I did a business degree, applied business degree at the same time, just to give me some sort of structure in the way, what I did. It was a great learning experience for me. You know, we, you know, we had reasonable success, but not a, not a lot of success. We had, um, we went through the advent of Super League, um, professionalism. A lot of money in the game, having to manage egos, um, you know. So, you know, the game was torn apart. So, it was it was a tough time in our game? And you know, I, here I am, a, a very, 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 very novice coach, trying to handle 
all that because coaching is not just about the head case, just not about coaching the footy team. It's about all the other things that come with that, you know, all the other um, you know, tensions, the media, your yep. sponsors, everything, you know, as you know, um, it's a difficult job and it, it takes a certain personality to, to do that, in my opinion. Um, and that's when I made the decision when I was coaching the Raiders and I did my business degree um, that I didn't want to coach. I actually made a decision I didn't want to coach mm. on, a, on a regular basis because I just didn't think I had the personality to do that. It's, it's not who I am. It's, I'm, I'm a person that that loves, you know, well, you know, you go back to my ancestry, I'm, that likes to wander a bit, you know, <laughs> likes to go from things to things, you know, yeah. likes to have different things happening in their lives, you know, they keep, I probably got a bit of a creative juice around yep. around what I what I like doing, you know, so, and having that, that, you know, the, the grind of every day, you know, watching footy and, yep. you know, preparing teams for, for games is, is not me. It's not what I want to do. And that's where rep football really, you know, come into, into calculations because, you know, you do it for a short period of the year and um, it suited suited who I am and yep. it suited the lifestyle I wanted to leave, uh, live. And um, it, it also keeps me involved and makes keeps me keeps me at the forefront and best practice, you know, the game and where the game is at as well. So it helps me to be more, keep relevant. How different was your relationship with the players that you played with and then had to coach? Uh, did you have to change? Did they have to change? Uh, that was the most difficult thing. Um, you know, so time heals. And, we, you know, there was a lot of fallouts at that time. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of fallouts mainly because of the whole rugby league environment, you know. <laughs> Um, it was it was a difficult time in our game, you know. So here I am, so here I am, inexperienced and trying to trying to move the club from semi-professional into professionalism, you know. So and here the players are trying to go from that semi-professionalism into full-time, you know, full-time training. It was very difficult to do, um, and it wasn't until it wasn't until I reckon you know 2000 and probably beyond that most teams got it right. Yeah. So it took us. Took us a lot, you know, because we had to get back together again in in '98, um, and then um, you know teams had to get together, you know. So we had Western Reds and the Mariners, and you know Adelaide Rams getting in combining to the Melbourne Storm, and yeah. just things like that. A lot of things were happening in the game that you know we had no control over. Um, and there's the angst between the two big media parties, as you yeah. know, and there's a lot of lot of bad blood going on, and and. And I think the clubs and relationships, you know, um, were affected through all that as well. Yeah. But you know, today, I mean, let me give me let, let me just clear the air there. So all the players that I that I coached in those times, you know, we're all we're all fine now. But there was some difficult times and difficult conversations we had to have through that period. Clarkie's Rugby League column is our social media go-to. On both Facebook and Instagram, it's daily, it's news, it's insights, it's fun and it's social, with a huge following and plenty of banter between fans. It's unique footy content with all proceeds being donated to charity. It's on Facey and Insta. Check it out. Clarkie's RL Column. At the end of 97, you replaced Ricky Stewart with Laurie Daly as captain. How did that rate in terms of blow-ups or fallouts? Uh, I didn't rate. He understood. He understood. Um, yeah, but um, it was a difficult conversation to have. And it was a difficult conversation for the club to have, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm stuck in the middle of it. And we're two great you know, Canberrans and two great Raiders people Um jostling for the spot, you know. So as, as we all know, history says that, that Ricky moved on uh, to Canterbury yep. for a couple of years. Um, I say, he mightn't say this, but I say, you know, it's actually the lessons learnt through all that has made him probably a better person and, and a greater coach today. Yep. And all those lessons moving, going, going out, going, moving elsewhere. But it was a difficult decision at the time. And it's great to have him back as the – as the you know the, the head coach of the, the Raiders, you know, when doing a terrific job, uh, it was just one of those things that happened at that particular time. Um, my relationship with Ricky now is excellent, and yeah, and same with Laurie. So 
yeah, but it's something you, 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 I wouldn't want to want to do. And I probably, again, but I'd probably handle it a lot better too. Okay. Club coaching to origin coaching, how similar, how different are the experiences if we take the time frame out of it? Oh, I think it's totally different. Yep. To be honest with you, you're working with the best players in the game that you got at your, your disposal. Um, so it's a more collaborative way of coaching, in my opinion. Um, it's not a, it's not dictatorial. You know, it's not coming in and telling people how you how you want to coach. I think it's everyone's, everyone's got to have input, and that's not just the senior leadership group. That's everyone. You know, if you and you said take time time out, but time is really important in this because everyone needs to understand their role in a sh- in the shortest period of time, and they got to understand what their plan is in the shortest period of time so you can prepare for it. So. Um, I think I think it's not it's not a it's coaching in a certain degree, but it's more around your man management and more collaborative in the way you do things and bringing the group together um, socially, um, bringing the group together through a core set of values yep. and standards that you expect out of the out of the, the maroon jersey, um, and you know letting them and, and giving them a really good history lesson into into those that come before and respecting all that, you know. So yeah, it's a. It's, I think it's, it's it's similar in a way, but but your everyday stuff that you do around collaboration in the, with the team is a lot is different to what you do at club level, where it's a bit more. What's the word I'm looking for? It's it's autocratic. You know, it's yeah. a bit a bit more autocratic with your day to day work, where you, you know your your coaches are working with players yeah. and you know teach them how to how to improve and things like that. But you haven't got that time frame to do that. The magical run of that Queensland side from 06 onwards. Do you realise at the time what you're doing and how special it is? Or don't you think like that at the time? Um, no, I, I, it is a special time. You get, get picked for Queensland yeah. <laughs> is a special time in, in your life. Um, you know, and particularly getting taboos and things like that. Um, and just... To, you're not playing. It's it's a different it's a different way of thinking. You know, I mean, obviously with club club land, you you, 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 know, you put your colours on and you're playing for your supporters, but you're playing for your state. Yeah. You know, you're playing for your state here, and that that is that is really important part of of the psyche going into it all. Um, you don't want to let your your colours down. You don't want to let the maroon colours down. Um, that's a really important part of the psyche to it all. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 very emotional. It's a, you, you've got to attach yourself emotionally to it. Or which you, I know you got to do that with everything you do, but yep. you know, but it's it's who you are. It's, it's in your DNA. It's, it's how you grow up. You know, this yep. is this is this is different. You know, so I went and played for the Raiders, but I didn't grow up a Raiders supporter. Yep. You know, um, but I was born in Queensland. But I grew up being a Queensland supporter. You know, yep. it's it's in your DNA. It's it's you know, you actually from a supporter's point of view. You know, you actually do hate the Blues. Yes. <laughs> Not so much the players, but, you know, you do hate, you do, from a supporter, you, it's it's bragging rights for 12 months. Yeah. That's what it is, you know. So, um, yeah, it's it's a – and, it, and it, the, the greatest satisfaction you get is to see the players win, obviously. But even more so because the group grew together. Yeah. You know, so the, yeah, a lot of, lot of players from different clubs, but the group grew together and today – they're all mates, you know. So they're all mates, and some of them they still they, they still get together and they have holidays together as families, you know. They all you know, uh, which is which is fantastic. That's that's the thing that I loved about it. We grew from a bunch of bunch of blokes, yep. you know. All of a sudden, all their wives and girlfriends started to be part of it. It's like building this family, and all of a sudden, these all these kids started to, to appear, um, you know. So the time at the end of ten years, you know, I mean, here this we got this. We've got 80 people, near 100 people, you know. This is the group, this is the family, this is the community we've, we've we managed to develop in that time. That's what gives me great satisfaction. And and the players, you know, obviously, you know, and, the, and their families, um, we all love success, don't we? You know, so uh, it, was, it was an extraordinary time for everyone. Does one individual memory from State of Origin stand out, a moment, a game, a series, above all others? I, 2006, game three, you know, uh, it, it's, I think everyone talks about it, you know, I know, and I talk about 
you know, Darren Lockyer and Darren even Darren talks about it, you know, that that, that game, you know, where we're down 14 4, you know, halfway through the, the second half off a dubious decision by the referee. Even Gus Bill said it was was wrong decision, you know, so that's that's how dubious it was. Yeah. But yeah, but you know, for Darren to gather the team, this is the belief part, you know, around our values and sticking firm to who we were and and believing the 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 bounce of the ball is going to, you know, bounce our way if we just keep on doing the things we're doing. And that's the, the generalised conversation he had had with the team. Just keep hanging in there, guys. You know, the ball will bounce our way. It'll it'll come back to us. But we just got to keep on doing the things we've been doing. And then you know, the next minute um, or two, John Thurston gets in the clear. It's the moment for John. You know, for him, that self belief gets in the, the clear with his famous dummy and puts 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 Brett. Tate over, you know, under the sticks. All of a sudden, it's 14-10, you know. Um, and then, you know, I think about five minutes out, you know, the, the person who believes it most, you know, puts a kick downfield. Our chase was excellent. Yeah. Um, we make the tackle. You know, young Hodson gets into gets into dummy half and the ball goes to ground, as we know. And the man that believed it most jumps on the footy and scores on the post, you know. 14 all, Clinton Sofoski. You know, you know, 16, 14, you know, we're still a minute and a half to go. And, you know, we still had our, our hearts in our hands. But, you know, I just think that was a defining moment for the team and, and the captain himself, really, you know. So um, so I think to me that was, you know, we talk about catalysts all the time, but I think that was the catalyst for our run. Uh, we got to the stage there, Andy, where our belief was too strong. We had to bring them back at times, you know. Wow. But, well, you know, we'll we'll get them behind in games, and you know, and some games would lose because we're getting them behind in games instead of starting quickly. Yeah. You know, so we had to we had conversations like that, and you know, all through all through it all. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the players had great great belief in themselves and each other, and kept on coming coming up with the right decisions, which was all all stem from I think that that game in in two thousand six. If you're enjoying Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legend series, we'd love for you to go to Apple, Spotify, or wherever you're listening and subscribe to the podcast and give us a five-star rating and review. Best weekly review wins an unfiltered trucker's hat. Mal, are the personal rewards different as a player and a coach? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, From a coach, it's... For me, um, like I said before, I want to see the players get all the accolades and all the success, and that's what they deserve. They should be in the spotlight. I don't want that. I mean, you know, I know that I know this might sound, I don't know, stupid, but you go through all that success we had through that period, and you won't get one photo of me being involved with the team and their celebrations after a game. Wow. Because it's their time, you know. We, we, we provide the platform. We provide the env- environment for them to to be successful, you know. Um, but they're the ones that get out there and, and go through that 80 minutes of rigour, grind, you know, stress, uh. decisions, you know. So uh, it's their moment. It's their moment. And and I think I think that they, they enjoyed that, yeah. you know, because as a group, um, we'd, have, we'd have photos afterwards and things like that, this, mm. you know, we'd, we'd get together. But just that moment on the footy field after they, after they, they win the series, it's their moment and that's the way they should – they should celebrate, celebrate, and that's just my feeling. That's that's how I feel about coaching and playing. Um, yeah, I, mean, I know there's a lot of hard work that goes into coaching, yeah. and a lot of stuff behind the scenes and stuff. We, we have our, we get, we get, we have our moments. Don't worry about that. We have our, we celebrate it. No, yeah. <laughs> that as well. I just think that particular that defining moment when they win a GF, yep. it's their moment, you know. And then, then all your staff come in and and help celebrate. Being named an immortal, can you explain that, what it meant to you? Not the typical cliched lines, but what it meant to Mal Meninga, the person. What's the cliched lines, Andy? I think the cliched line, the one I'd probably run with, would be, yeah, probably the highlight of my football career. <laughs> yeah, no, no my, my um, way I described it was it was a personal personal accolade yeah. for everyone that supported me through my career. So, so, you know, obviously from my first ever coach, was, which was Dad, our 
coach at school, the people that supported me and stuck by me through my whole life, that to them, that's to them I think that is the the ultimate accolade and thank you for for their faith and loyalty in me. That's that's the way I describe the immortal tag is that you know, I've been on a bit of a journey and a lot of people have been around me all that in that all that time. Um, I've had a lot of lot of detractors and I've had a lot of supporters. But I just feel that for all my for all the people that had an influence on my life and those who supported me, um, to them it's a big thank you. I think in thirty years that is perhaps the greatest answer I've ever heard. Well done. And it, it says Thanks, a lot of, it says a lot about you as a man, I, I must admit. Thank you. What are you most proud of as you look back across the journey? That? Yeah. I've just answered it, mate. Honestly, yeah. I've just answered it, answered it. I mean, I've been a lot of, you know, I've been really lucky, you know, played with some great coaches, great mentors, great people around me, great teams, great players. Um, you know, so, and when I talk about, when I talk about getting the immortal tag, it's all those, all my teammates. Yeah. You know, the Laurie Darleys, the Ricky Stewart's down to, you know, a Wayne Collins is an example. Yep. You know, someone has played a handful of games with. You know, all those people that I played footy with. You know, um, so that's what I'm most proud of is that I've done the right thing by them. Because yep. they've 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 stuck up for me. You know, my brother used to get into into battles all the time. But, um, get into fights. You know, all the time about me and you know from the you know people who, who bag me. You know, so yeah. to them. To them, it's, it's like giving them the, the golden finger, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. See, right. I told you. Yeah, I told you. And to me, that's that gives me the, the greatest of satisfaction because, um, yeah, because it, there you go, up yours. Is there a regret? Something you wish you could change? Oh, not really. It's it's all ex- it's all experience. You know, I would love to have, I would love to have captain a, an Origin series win. And mm-hmm. you know, I would have loved to have done that. And I would love to have gone back to to St Helens again. You know, like we talked about before, but you know that's that's part of my motivation when I took on the origin side. So that, I've I've turned that into that negative into a positive. You know, so I don't I want these players to experience a victory. You know, yeah. and I want I want I want a Darren, I want a you know, Cameron Smith, and whoever's going to captain the side. I, I want them to to experience you know winning winning a series as a player. And that's that was my motivation. The irony of a life lived under the spotlight is the man behind the footballer would rather be at home in the company of family and close mates having a quiet, in-depth chat than in the spotlight. I think that probably sums you up pretty well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm happy at home. COVID's, COVID's been a blessing, Andy, for me, to be <laughs> honest with you. It's, um, that's the way I look at things. You know, it's been, I've spent more time with family. Um, it's funny. It's you can do things. I would look at us today. You know, chatting. Yeah. You know, um, every day I'm in the meetings, but but I'm home. You know, how good's that? You know, so um, don't have to get dressed up. I'm not a Thai person, not a suit person. You know, I'm a I'm a bushy. You know, I like putting yeah. the shorts and shirt on and a pair of thongs. That's that's what I like doing. You're big on. I won't say self improvement. I'll say self progression. Are you still working on that better version at 60 years of age? Oh, absolutely. Good absolutely. Idea. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, I won't be the best coach I can possibly be. You know, I don't coach on a regular basis, but, you know, I've got to be, I've got to be up to speed with everything I do, you know, so I've got to be contemporary all the time. So I've got to understand, you know, times are changing, people are changing. Um, footy doesn't change. Footy's changed technically perhaps, but footy hasn't changed from a metal aptitude point of view you know you still got to have the same characteristics to play the game of rugby league but the game's evolving on field you know so what a great endorsement it has this year i think amount of points being scored and it highly entertaining you know so the game's evolving at the moment you know, through through a set of rules that has uh, sped up the game but you watch you know in, in times not too far down the track you know coaches teams will find a way to slow that all down, you know, so the defensive qualities will come back into the game. But that's how you evolve the game. So the game evolves all the time. So as individuals evolve in the game, you've, you've got to keep up with it. 
on and off the field, the achievements and the accolades are, in all honesty, too many to mention. But through it all, you have not changed, not a bit, since I met you in 1990. Actually, on my very first day of work, you've left a footprint on the game of rugby league that will never wear away and an impression on many fans and friends you've made along the way. Mal Meninga, you, sir, are a legend. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. I really appreciate it. Nice, kind words. Thank you. A new episode of the Legend series drops every Tuesday and the weekly Wodge every Thursday. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening and follow us on social media at The Andy Raymond. Then you won't miss a thing. Come back soon, Legends.